Sergeants, you may begin your recording. We're getting ready to go. Mr. Leonardo, you can take the uh, opening. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the remote hearing on the Committee of Environmental Protection. At this time, we ask that all council members and council staff turn on their video for verification purposes. Please place all cell phones and electronic devices to silent or vibrate. You can submit your testimony via email by sending it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. We thank you for your cooperation and we will begin shortly. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining our virtual hearing today. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge the council members that have joined us. I think we're at the moment joined uh, by uh, Council Member Kalman Yeager. Um, my name is Stephen Levin. Um, I am uh, a member of the committee and um, filling in for Chair Constantinidis this morning. Um, um, you may be joining um, in a little bit, but uh, I'm filling in to to start um, to start the hearing. Um, I'm going now to turn it over to our moderator, uh, Committee Council Samara Swanston, to go over some procedural items. Hi, I'm Samara Swanston. <clears throat> I'm counsel to the Committee on Environmental Protection for the New York City Council. Before we begin. I would like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling panelists to testify. Please, list, please listen for your name to be called and I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. We will begin with testimony from the administration, specifically Dep uh, DEP Commissioner uh, Vincent Sapienza, uh, who's going to offer testimony on intro um, 1851, as well as intro uh, 142 and 143. And then we will also hear testimony from Commissioner Melanie LaRocca on intro 1946. And we will hear testimony from the Mayor's Office of Sustainability Deputy Director Kiwe on intro 1982. Now I will call you when it's your time, when it's your turn to speak. During the member, during the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes. That includes the answers. Uh, thank you very much.
Thank you very much, uh, Committee Council Samara Swanson. Um, I uh, bear with me. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, as I said, I'm Council Member Stephen Levin, filling in for Chair Costa Constantinidis. Um, welcome to this hearing on introductions 1851, 1982, 1946, which are sponsored by Chair Constantinidis, um, and introductions 142 and 143 that I, Council Member Stephen Levin, I'm sponsoring. Uh, thank you um, to the chair uh, for working on this important piece of pieces of package of legislation. Um, uh, as I said, uh, we were joined by Councilmember Kalman Yeager this morning, um, and I will acknowledge uh, other council members as they join us. The outbreak of COVID-19 in our city has been financially devastating. However, the improvements proposed by the legislation today will not impose financial burdens on the city. The department, the department had previously determined to strengthen its enforcement authority and upgrade its wastewater disposal requirements as it pertained to construction sites and stormwater disposal. These improvements were intended to address contraventions of the Clean Water Act in New York City. This legislation will move us toward compliance with the Clean Water Act in local waters. Despite the pandemic, the department remains committed to these wastewater infrastructure improvements. Um, I am now going to read a few remarks regarding the legislation that uh, I, Councilmember Levin, am sponsoring. Sorry, having some technical difficulties. Apologize. Okay. So we have a lot of work to do to right the environmental wrongs of our past and move forward to a more environmentally just future. The district that I represent in North Brooklyn and Gowanus particularly knows this history all too well. A critical step in addressing the toxins in our air and soil and improving accountability, a critical step is addressing the toxins in our air and soil and improving accountability of our environmental malfeasance. Change and accountability start with being fully informed of what is in our air, soil, and water and making sure businesses and agencies are doing everything needed to protect New Yorkers' health and well-being. This requires that we implement strict measures for adherence to health and safety practices. Certain types of dust, like styrofoam pellets, get into our air and waterways, polluting our environment and adding to our environmental hazards that the, the, adding to the environmental hazards our communities have faced for a long time. My office receives reports regularly about construction dust and styrofoam flying off of construction sites, which can get into people's respiratory systems and our waterways harming wildlife. Construction companies have a responsibility to safeguard their construction sites. Intro 142 prohibits construction dust from becoming airborne and requires the owner 
or company to establish a construction dust mitigation plan, specifically how they will prevent potential health hazards. I look forward to hearing from the administration and advocates on this issue today and discuss solutions that our city can take to improve government accountability and protection against airborne contaminants. I also want to acknowledge that the, the, the community members who are testifying today, who have been longstanding environmental leaders in North Brooklyn uh, and who have been instrumental in advancing this legislation. And I just really want to acknowledge um, in the environmental community in North Brooklyn and Greenpoint in particular is um, second to none in the city of New York. And um, uh, they have for generations now uh, held elected officials and city officials accountable uh, for the environmental health um, of our communities uh, far beyond um, just the neighborhood of Greenpoint. So I wanna thank uh, them for their ongoing work on this. I'll turn it back over to the community council. Hi. Uh, I'm now going to, to deliver the oath to the administration, and I will call on you each individually to recall your answers to be followed by your testimony. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee, and to respond honestly to the council member questions? These are, this is for Deputy Commissioner um, Sapienza, um, <clears throat> DOB Commissioner Melanie LaRocca uh, and the Mayor's Office of Sustainability Deputy Director um, Kiwai. Um, you can raise your hands and affirm, please. I do. Thank you. Uh, you may begin when ready. Thank you. So good morning to the chair and members of the committee. I'm Vincent Sapienza, commissioner of the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, several of my colleagues are joining on the call today, including Angela Lakata, DEP's deputy commissioner for sustainability. So I'm here to speak about three bills. The first is intro 1851, which would amend the city's administrative code, building code and plumbing code to create a uniform citywide stormwater management requirement. The other two bills, intros 142 and 143, both relate to air quality. Intro 142 would expand the current law to prevent certain types of construction dust from becoming airborne. Intro 143 would create an emergency ambient air quality monitoring program. I will address intro 1851 first. The bill is critical to the city meeting state standards to manage stormwater and will provide several benefits to city residents, including reduced flooding, improved harbor water quality, and a simplified site connection, house connection permit application process. New York City has two main types of sewers, the municipal separate storm sewer system and the combined sewer system. In the MS4 system, stormwater and wastewater are conveyed through separate sewers, so all sanitary waste goes to a wastewater resource recovery facility or WRRF, while all stormwater discharges directly to the nearest waterway. In the combined sewer system, stormwater and wastewater flow through the same pipe system to be treated at a WRRF. During periods of intense rain, there is a risk that additional stormwater volume can exceed the combined sewer system's capacity. During such periods, the combined stormwater and wastewater may be diverted from the WRRF in order to protect the treatment processes at the WRRF and discharge directly into area waterways. These diversions are known as combined sewer overflows or CSOs. DEP has invested billions of dollars to reduce CSO frequency and volume in order to improve water quality in local waterways. A key strategy is to reduce the volume of stormwater that enters the system by managing stormwater on site where it falls. Most of New York City's land area consists of impervious surfaces, which impede the ground's absorption of stormwater. When stormwater cannot be absorbed by the ground, it has to be conveyed by DEP infrastructure to either a WRRF or into the harbor water around the city. 
Green infrastructure practices such as green roofs, rain gardens, and permeable pavements allow sites to capture stormwater where it falls, treating it as a resource rather than a waste. Improving stormwater management by requiring more on-site stormwater control increases sewer capacity and improves water quality. It also reduces urban flooding, lowers the burden on public infrastructure, and reduces energy demands. In 2012, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, DEC, issued the city a CSO consent order that includes a requirement that New York City build and facilitate green infrastructure to manage stormwater. Specifically, it requires the city to build enough green infrastructure to reduce CSOs by 1.67 billion gallons per year by 2030. Since 2010, DEP has committed $1.6 billion to fund green infrastructure projects on city-owned property, such as a public right-of-way, schools, parks, and housing. Through partnerships with the Department of Transportation, Parks and Recreation, and Design and Construction, as well as with the Economic Development Corporation and the New York City Housing Authority, DEP has over 10,000 green infrastructure assets constructed or in design. We have successfully greened over 1,200 acres across the city. Intro 1851 will allow DEP to build on these successes while ensuring stormwater management is unified citywide. The bill will require new construction to manage more stormwater runoff onsite using techniques like green infrastructure. Our scientific modeling shows that its implementation will provide CSO reductions, uh, an additional 362 million gallons per year CSO volume reduction by 2030 to further improve water quality per CSO order regulations. Additionally, it will increase green space and align with the goals of the 2019 Climate Mobilization Act. In 2017, the council passed intro 1346, which authorized DEP to set rules regarding stormwater management in areas of the city that are served by the MS4. This authority was necessary because DEC had issued the city an MS4 permit, which required the city to reduce the volume of pollutants that drained through the MS4 into the city's waterways. The bill being considered today, intro 1851, expands DEP's rulemaking authority to cover the entire city, not just the MS4 area. Passage of this bill would allow the city to meet DEC requirements and to continue to improve the health of our waterways. Uh, just a little bit on, on the benefits to permit applicants. Uh, our primary goal for this bill is to improve stormwater management around the city, but the bill also streamlines existing requirements uh, by applying them uniformly across the city and clarify who must apply for permits. Since the 2012 stormwater rule was promulgated, different areas of the city have different stormwater management requirements. A new unified stormwater rule will benefit new developments by creating simpler and more streamlined site connection and house connection permit applications, uh, providing new formulas that are easier to use, establishing consistency across sewer areas, making it easier for applicants to plan, allowing more flexibility and design options than those previously permitted, providing clear credit for infiltration practices and reuse systems, and establishing a new stormwater design manual. Upon passage of the bill, DEP will promulgate rules pursuant to the City Administrative Procedures Act, which provides notice and ample opportunity for comment to all who would be affected by the new rules. DEP has kicked off outreach to a large number of stakeholders, including development community and their technical advisors who have been active in the development of the Green Infrastructure Program and the MS4 program. We've held multiple meetings and workshops with sister agencies, as well as the Economic Development Corporation, and we will continue to conduct outreach to council staff, community boards, environmental organizations, engineers, architects, and developers. Because of the work the city has done, our waters are now cleaner than they have been in over 150 years. We look forward to continuing our collaboration with the council as we continue to work on this. Uh, now on intro 142, uh, it would amend the existing law regarding construction dust by adding additional materials that are prohibited from becoming airborne. DEP supports clarifying the materials whose use can result in the release of dust. The air code is currently broad enough to include any dust that becomes airborne, and DEP has rules in place to regulate the measures that shall be taken to prevent such air pollution from becoming airborne. Uh, our air code inspectors will be able to incorporate these changes from intro 142 into our procedures. 
uh, on intro 143 uh, would create an emergency ambient air quality monitoring program within DEP for response after certain large fires. We have consulted with our partners at FDNY and DOHMH, and we do not believe that it is necessary to conduct air quality monitoring after typical fires. The chemicals released are often very similar, so testing is not necessary to inform the actions needed to avoid smoke exposure. Therefore, the best approach to ensure safety is to keep the public away from the impacted area and to perform a thorough and proper cleanup of affected areas immediately after the fire incident. Any air quality monitoring that is conducted would not change the recommended response for mitigating exposure to contaminants. Furthermore, the city maintains a database of on-site chemical storage through the Right to Know program. If a fire occurs, the database allows FDNY and DEP to immediately determine if there are chemicals of concern inside without having to wait hours or days for lab results from the air sample. We all share the same goal. We and our partner agencies are happy to continue working with the council to ensure that all best practices are followed to protect public health and the environment following a large fire. Thank you for this opportunity to testify and my colleagues and I will be glad to answer any questions you have. Hi, uh, this is the committee council, Samara Swanston. We need to make sure that all of the administration members that are going to answer questions have been sworn in. So I was given a list of additional people, Maureen Little and uh, Gina uh, Borka, and um, everyone who was on the list and is here to testify or answer questions, you need to be sworn in before you proceed. Is there someone else like Gina Borka or um, the Angela Licata or anyone else who was not sworn, Maureen Little, anyone who was not sworn, can you please um, raise your hand now? Okay. <clears throat> Do you um, swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to the council member questions? I do. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, and now we can proceed with the administration's testimony. Good morning, uh, Chair and Council Members uh, of the Committee on Environmental Protection. I'm Melanie LaRocca. I'm Commissioner of the New York City Department of Buildings. I'm joined by my colleague, Gina Bokra, Chief Sustainability Officer at the department. We're pleased to be here today to offer testimony on intro 1946 regarding outreach to building owners around making their buildings more sustainable. Engaging those who do business with us is critical to the work the department does. This includes building owners, contractors, design professionals, and construction workers. Education is a key component of this engagement. Educating the public can help us keep our construction sites and buildings safe and now through our implementation of the Climate Mobilization Act make our buildings more sustainable. The department is committed to increasing the sustainability of buildings. This goal can only be accomplished if building owners do their part to reduce greenhouse gas emissions coming from their buildings, which are the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in New York City. The department has already taken steps to educate owners of their obligations under Local Law 97 of 2019, which regulates greenhouse gas emissions from buildings exceeding 25,000 gross square feet, and will continue to work to educate owners leading up to 2024, the date by which they must first meet emissions limits established by the law and beyond. To date, the department has updated its website to provide information to owners about the requirements of Local Law 97 and established a dedicated email address to field inquiries from owners. We're using the inquiries we receive to develop additional resources we can use to educate owners. We are also informing new building applicants of their obligations under this law when they submit plans to the department so that they can start planning to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the very beginning of their construction projects. This fall, we will be conducting outreach directly to owners of the worst performing buildings so they know where they stand early on. 
We will then focus on conducting outreach to all owners of buildings subject to local law 97. Intro 1946 requires that owners receive information regarding making their buildings more sustainable at the conclusion of an inspection of their gas piping system. This is not the best time to share information with owners about making their buildings more sustainable or about Local Law 97, as these inspections of gas piping systems that occur every four years, which are not conducted by the department. Additionally, the universe of buildings subject to these inspections of gas piping systems is much broader than the universe of buildings subject to Local Law 97. The department supports the intent of this bill and would like to work with this committee to identify better opportunities to connect with owners about making their buildings more sustainable. For example, the department plans to conduct direct outreach to owners of buildings subject to Local Law 97 by sending them letters, emails, or by leveraging existing resources to connect with them, like including information on their property tax bills. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I would welcome any questions you may have. Okay, are there any other um, uh, members of the administration that wish to testify? Okay, I don't believe so. Um, if so, please use the raise hand function, I think, on the on Zoom. Would you like me to testify in introduction 1982? Um, sorry, who said that? My name is Kawe. I'm supposed to testify. Oh, yes. On yes yes, yes. oh please do yes hi thank you hi uh good morning council member 11 and members of the committee on environmental protection my name is ka Wei, and i'm the assistant deputy director for energy at the mayor's office of sustainability and the mayor's office of resiliency i will be discussing introduction 1982 from chair constantinides let me begin by thanking once again the chair and the council for their work on the historic legislation we achieved together last year, now known as Local Law 97. Local Law 97 is the centerpiece of last year's Climate Mobilization Act. The first of its kind piece of legislation requires all buildings larger than 25,000 square feet to meet bold carbon reduction targets starting in 2024. The legislation affirmed New York City's position as a leading city in the fight against climate change and its level of ambition is commensurate with the scale of the climate crisis we are facing. As you may recall, one of the central aspects of Local Law 97 was the creation of its advisory board that will provide guidance to the Department of Buildings as it implements Local Law 97. One of the many responsibilities of this diverse group, which counts architects, tenant advocates, engineers, environmental justice representatives, building owners and other experts appointed by the council and by the administration among its members is to identify the appropriate carbon emissions factors against which distributed energy resources from solar to storage to heat pumps will be credited. This process is currently underway. Now let me turn to introduction 1982. This bill specifies the source for the factors that would be used to calculate the marginal greenhouse gas emissions from natural gas fuel cells. We believe that all technologies under consideration in Local Law 97 should be treated consistently. Identifying the most appropriate emissions factor against which resources are compared and credited should be done by the industry experts convened in the advisory board and working groups as stated in Local Law 97. Identifying these factors takes intensive study and the work is already underway to choose the factors in advance of the January 1, 2023 deadline. Natural gas fuel cells are already receiving special treatment by being credited against a marginal carbon emissions factor. Intro 1982 now further establishes the specific factor that applies only to natural gas fired fuel cells. If this approach is ultimately successful, the work of the advisory board will be undermined and the result will be that this fossil fuel-based technology will be given preferential treatment. Finally, the value that intro 1982 locks in as the potential marginal emissions factor has not been vetted or approved by the LL97 advisory board. 
The factor does not appear to be specific to electricity consumed in New York City, and the factor is not dynamic. Marginal emissions rates can vary significantly on an hourly, daily, and seasonal basis, depending on how much electricity we are using and what generation and transmission resources are available. Local Law 97 is a once in a lifetime proposal that moves New York City significantly down the path to carbon neutrality by 2050. For these reasons, we urge the council to let the process established by Local Law 97 play out and give the advisory board and the Department of Buildings the time needed to establish the emissions factors for all technologies being considered. We look forward to further discussions with council but urge you to reconsider introduction 1982. Okay, thank you At very much. Point, I would like to remind council members, uh, 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 administration members to unmute themselves so they can uh, be available for testimony uh, to, to answer questions uh, posed by the administration, posed by the <clears throat> by the council members, sorry. So thank you for unmuting yourself. Okay, thank you very much, uh, committee council. Um, I just want to, um, sorry, once more acknowledge the bills that we're hearing today are 142, 143, 1851, 1946, and 1982. Um, and I also want to acknowledge Council Member Eric Ulrich has joined us as well. Um, and I will proceed on uh, questions. Uh, Council members, if you have questions, uh, please use the raise hand function. And I'm going to apologize ahead of time if you hear chatter in the background. That's my two children. As you can probably see, I'm in the craft room right now. So I apologize in advance. Um, uh, so this could, um, this could be for, um, for any of the members of the administration. Um, what are the biggest environmental threats that, that EJ communities face respect, uh, respecting air pollution at this time? Uh, I'll, I'll start, uh, this is Commissioner Sapienza at DEP and uh, my, my staff can chime in. Um, you know, given, given urban settings, um, there's, there's emissions from, from boilers and buildings, there's emissions from uh, heavy traffic on streets. Uh, those, are, those are the two primary um, sources of, of air pollution in, in, in dense communities and EJ communities. Uh, Angela Licata, our Deputy Commissioner for Sustainability, if you'd like to jump in. Sure. Um, in the 30 plus years that I've been working for the city of New York, we have um, really enjoyed tremendous benefits in the reductions in a lot of the um, national criteria pollutants. Uh, and so we're at a point in time, frankly, where the most concern is now related to the particulate matter and to um, some NO2 issues, but for the most part, we are actually below all of the federal uh, requirements. Um, and so we have really targeted limited um, sources at this point. We have undergone um, revisions, thank you to the city council for approving those changes to our air code recently, where we are looking at um, some of the cooking issues uh, that generate uh, particulate matter, particularly from cook stoves and various meat char broiling and, and that sort of thing. But at this point in time, um, we are really targeting a very discrete sources and obviously, you know, tailpipe emissions are still a concern, but even that has really lessened over time. I would just add maybe that the biggest concerns now are really looking at various communities where there are heavily tra uh, trafficked corridors. So as a result of the proximity to those 
um, corridors, we do see elevated um, incidents of asthma and, and those types of health um, incidents. But we um, generally across the city enjoy a very good air quality. Thank you very much, Deputy Commissioner. Um, there is evidence um, from a survey that was carried out uh, in the US by the Harvard School of Public Health um, that identified um, that there's a strong association uh, between increases in particulate matter concentrating concentration and mortality rates in, in communities due to COVID-19. Um, does the city see this as a concern? Are there, are there any um, uh, plans that have been put into place to monitor and mitigate particulate matter emissions, uh, particularly in communities where uh, there seems to be an increased uh, incidence of COVID-19 and, and uh, the mortality rate? I want to know if there's anybody from the health department that wanted an opportunity to participate. And if not, I'll just, I'll speak to that, but is, is anybody from DOHMH? Uh, I'm on the call. I'm Maureen Little, Bureau of Science Advisor for the Environmental Disease and Injury Prevention. Um, we do monitor PM2.5 across neighborhoods. Um, I. I would have to come back to you on whether we have that set up, particularly looking at the COVID-19 neighborhoods. Um, those are, we have, as part of the New York City Air Community Air Study, we monitor PM2.5 as well as some other air pollutants across neighborhoods and make comparisons um, across neighborhoods for PM2.5. Of course, that is also a concern for other things such as asthma, heart disease, other cardiovascular impacts. But perhaps Steve could also mention other factors that are going on with that. It is as far as outdoor air. Um, that would be great to see if we could, um, uh, particularly in neighborhoods that have been most affected by COVID, um, see if there's uh, associations at all between uh, higher levels of of particulate contaminants and um, and whether there there's any any type of association whatsoever. Um, do we see that COVID has exacerbated air pollution risks in, in communities of color? Is that um, a question you can answer? not a question that I am very familiar with at this time. However, air pollution for a while was going down with decreased traffic. However, those levels have gone up. I, I, I wouldn't be able to answer a very good answer at this time. However, that would, air pollution would only be one factor and it's still up in the air. Some of the air Um, the next question could be for um, uh, DEP or, or um, DOB. Um, looking at the current levels of civil penalty, what are the current levels for uh, civil penalty for failing to prevent construction dust, particulate matter, from becoming airborne? Uh, and how is that monitored? We, we get a lot of, I mean, I'll just uh, anecdotally in my district, um, I get a lot of complaints because of all the construction going on um, that uh, community members will call 311 um, and there's the follow-up is so far behind. In other words, like 311 um, won't, um, you know, DEP won't be able to go out for a few days. And um, during that time, um, situation may have changed the dust the the particulate matter might might be not there there might not be a work day um how how do we approach enforcement and are we is that a a um 
is that subject to review that policy on an ongoing basis? I'll start and then um, Deputy Commissioner Lakata could chime in. So uh, our staff who, who enforce the air code, they'll do both proactive inspections of construction sites, uh, but they'll also respond when there are complaints uh, to 311. Uh, the, the, the challenge, as, as you mentioned, council member, is just timing. You know, if there can be a, a, a dust com uh, concern or, uh, you know, dust coming off a site for minutes or maybe an hour uh, before our crews can, can get there to respond. Um, I think Deputy Commissioner Lakata and her team um, have done a good job in, in tracking um, locations and hotspot monitoring on 311 uh, to get out there more quickly, but I'll let her uh, continue. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, at this point, you know, we have um, fairly rapid response to a lot of these issues. Um, we have now developed another shift to the air noise inspectors um, so that they're covering more of, of the time in which construction is allowed, including sometimes when it is necessary to do after hours construction. So we like to um, get as many of those addresses as possible that show up on our dashboard that we can actually have staff that are positioned in the field um, respond as, as quickly as possible to these events. If you are experiencing, and I, and I hate to promote a sort of one-off approach because we do rely very heavily on the 311 complaint system, but if your constituents are experiencing dust related to um, specific sites or they are recurring um, at specific sites, please let us know and we will definitely um, be able to uh, do investigations of those particular locations. And as the commissioner mentioned, you know, dust is problematic in the sense that it can be fleeting um, with respect to certain activities on the site. But we are pretty aggressive with respect to um, dust mitigation. So the first thing that we will do if we observe it is to ask um, for the wetting and for appropriate mitigation measures to be employed. Uh, we don't always um, issue an NOV as the first level of defense. We often seek to cure the activity and then oftentimes we have follow-up visits. So I am troubled if your constituents are experiencing um, dust from sites that are plaguing um, certain locations and I would appreciate receiving those locations from you. Um, are there any proactive uh, steps that DEP takes um, in kind of known hotspots? So if there are areas where, um, for instance, uh, DOB building permits um, are, you know, at a high frequency or there are, you know, there are housing starts that you can get from uh, um, city planning. Um, are there proactive steps that we take so that we're addressing these issues before they become problems in the community? Well, we don't necessarily have a staff that is sufficient to do sort of the regular drive-bys. Um, we are um, in more of a response mode uh, to concerns that are um, brought to our attention. Uh, having said that though, I often receive comments from other deputy commissioners and other um, constituents that are very sensitive to these types of concerns and that will alert us to issues as they are arising. Um, is there a, a watch list of particular construction companies that, um, that have continued to have you know, a, a series of violations or a frequency of violations? So that is definitely um, something that we try to employ. If there's been a NOV, or in fact, if we have made recommendations for um, dust that is exacerbated by certain activities, we will try it. The um, staff resources are available to do those follow-ups. And in most cases, we don't have a lot of, um, you know, repeat offenders. Every once in a while, we will get a situation like that, and that will obviously have to be adjudicated. Um, but for the most part, we find that a lot of the contractors do 
um, tend to take the issue seriously when our inspectors uh, show up. Every once in a while, we've had to issue a temporary stop work order. In other words, it's not a stop work order for the entire site, but for that particular activity, we'll ask them to cease and desist if their methods are not um, addressing the, the issue associated with the dust. I'm sorry, can you uh, define NOB? Oh, I apologize. That's a notice of violation. Oh, an NOV, NOV, V as in Victor. Yes. Got it, okay. Um, okay, thank you. Um, bear with me if you don't mind. What other mitigation strategies are, do we use other than, than uh, wetting? Um, for instance, I, I, I mean, I can just speak to when they next door to my building, we're doing um, insulation and the amount of um, their, uh, I think they were cutting some of the styrofoam associated with in insulation and they were just styrofoam particles everywhere, um, blowing up and down, down the block. Is that um, wetting doesn't necessarily um, address that or catch that? Um, what... Uh, what other mitigation strategies are there available on construction sites? Yeah, I'm not really very familiar with the styrofoam um, particle issues. I haven't heard um, of how we would mitigate that. I would suspect though, if wetting is not appropriate, then we would want some type of containment, um, some type of netting or some type of uh, locking that material for becoming airborne and from emanating onto the street or public spaces. We would expect that material to remain on the premises. Um, in a situation like that, we might even work with uh, DOB in terms of uh, what types of measures could be um, installed and or utilized to address that issue. Um, that's an interesting one though, and sounds like a bit of a one-off. So. Uh, is that activity still occurring at that it site? Happens, it happens throughout Greenpoint at all times. I think I see Greenpoint residents right now on the Zoom call, um, uh, uh, kind of laughing because it's it is it is it is so pervasive um, in this community because we have so much construction. It's you know we have the waterfront construction, but we have a lot of upland construction. There are uh, older uh, uh, buildings that are, uh, you know, were dilapidated I mean, that have that are, have come down. I mean, we have at any given time. There's probably, I don't know, got to be scores of of construction sites just in this neighborhood, and um, we see it all over the place. I mean, it's a that is that's actually the the impetus for this legislation came from discussions around that particular issue. So I, you know, what I would love to do is I would love to take a walk out and see some of those sites with you and your constituents, if we could arrange for something next week. Um, I, I understand that sometimes these activities are hard to catch, but mm -hmm. I would be willing to make, um, you know, return visits as well. So if we could get a list of sites together and you can um, tell me when you can be available or I will go out with my inspectors and take a look ourselves and then we can get back to you with what types of strategies we think might be effective against this type of airborne pollutant. Fantastic, that'd be great. We can crowdsource the sites, I think, pretty pretty effectively in the neighborhood. Um, okay, I'm gonna, uh, Chair Constantinidis has, 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 uh, has joined us, so I'm gonna turn it over to him. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, I wanna thank uh, Councilmember Steve Levin uh, for being an amazing council member, an environmental advocate, and, 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 and a great friend as well. Thank you, Steve, for uh, standing in for me this morning as I had some family uh, health issues. So thank you, Steve. And I hope your family as well, as well, and everyone as thank well. You, thank you. Um, just so, so I know that we, uh, I'm just going to jump right in. I hope uh, everyone's doing okay. Uh, Commissioner, good to see you. Uh, it's better, to, better to see you. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to be seen. It is good to be seen. Uh, so I have questions. Um, let's jump right in. I think uh, I think 1946 and 1982. 
Uh, what programs and educational services are available to inform building owners uh, that want to place, replace existing gas infrastructure and want to do it in a more renewable way? I assume that's to me, council member. Uh, thank you very much. Um, sure, it's, a pleasure to to, see you. it's a pleasure to see you as well. Um, we're happy to support any effort uh, by the council or others to ensure that owners are aware of their obligations, one with the existing laws, certainly, and two um, with opportunities to do work uh, in the future in a more sustainable way. With respect to 19, introduction 1946 um, and its connection to local law 97, the department does believe very strongly we must engage owners on their obligations around local law 97 and ensure that they're aware of the upcoming deadlines and aware that uh, moving forward, they will have heightened expectations for their building's performance. We have begun that outreach um, and we'll continue to do so, do so. Um, particularly starting this fall, we'll be targeting the um, uh, worst performing buildings um, and directly outreaching to that group of property owners, as well as once that is done, the full set of owners around Local Law 97. So we look forward to doing that and more importantly, look forward to working with the council and other stakeholders on exactly how best to do that. As it relates to gas piping, we don't believe that connection is appropriate given that the inspections are done on a four year cycle and also done by um, representatives who do not uh, work for the <coughs> Department of Buildings. So uh, we believe in the purpose, look forward to working with you. Great, no, I, mean, I think that we need, you know, we need to get building owners to understand that they have to move away from traditional fossil fuels, right? I think that's the goal is to make sure that they understand their options and that this bill is not going away, right? So I think there are some building owners who believe that, well, we'll wait out, you know, we'll wait out certain timelines and that, you know, these things will disappear. Um, so I think we just need to let them know that this is real yep. and it's best to start thinking about this now rather than, you know, when the homework is due in a couple of years, right? Absolutely. So you'll see uh, for new applicants who have submitted new building uh, proposals to the department, we started uh, uh, when Local Law 97 went into effect, uh, putting on every single application information about Local Law 97. Uh, very early with respect to when things actually go into effect. But to that point, we need to make sure that everybody understands at the Department of Buildings, we are in fact moving forward with the implementation of Local Law 97 We've moved forward with starting the advisory board. We've had three meetings. Our working groups are in place and working to produce product. So on our end, we continue to work to advance it. Um, and you're right, we need to make sure everybody is very clear. That is what we are doing. We have no expectations of not doing that and we'll continue to move forward. How do we support building owners uh, transition away from uh, gas infrastructure, right? If, so, if they come to the DOB and say, or even if they're doing a major construction project, uh, are, we ch are we talking to them about uh, other options? Are we, give are we giving them options? Are we saying, hey, look, while you're doing X, you can also sort of, you know, here's an opportunity to do Y because your building's gonna be up soon. What's our sort of thought process around that? I mean, I think that in part was the thought process of making sure that for applications for new buildings, we make sure people understand that it is not just good enough to meet current energy code, right? And you have to plan for 2025 when the bill may come due. And so we've started the conversation. I wanna figure out a way to do more of that while also ensuring that the Department of Buildings does not take on the role of architect or engineer for individuals, I think we can absolutely strike that balance to make sure we are in fact telling people there are multiple pathways. I think you've seen that done with our most recent energy code that again tries to disincentivize existing biases in the system. So let's keep working on it, but I think you're right council member, that's a good point and we should figure out how this department can play a more aggressive role. How, how does the retrofit accelerator fit into that? 
um, conversation, right? And I know that you don't want to become architect and and sort of running their projects, uh, but the retrofit accelerator, that's kind of their gig. Um, so wh where, where do they fit in that sort of scheme of things with DOB to make that happen? Agree that there is definitely a handoff. Uh, my colleagues from MOS are on, so I'm gonna defer to them to answer, <clears throat> but we definitely believe there is a very much of an ecosystem of making sure the department is pushing and that there are resources, and of course, MOS is there to support. So I'm, I have to defer to my colleagues on that. So as you know, uh, Chair Constantinides, as part of the uh, One NYC announcement last year, we uh, committed to expand, sorry, tripling the budget of the Retrofit Accelerator, which is now actually um, renamed New York City Accelerator. And, it's very much within the mission and objective of that program to provide technical assistance to building owners to look at options that get them off fossil fuel dependency. And we've added new pillars, including a focus on new construction as well as retrofits to facilitate those efforts. Uh, happy to provide additional details around how that program is coordinating with DOB. Once I check back in with my colleagues, happy to report back. Great, and I just want to make sure that if someone's coming to DOB and they're having these conversations with them, that there's a seamless transition, right? That they're the retrofit accelerator, DOB, that may not be their job, but it is the job of the retrofit accelerator to provide that sort of technical support and help. Um, so I want to make sure that we're all sort of like plugged in the right way, right? That nothing falls through the cracks. And if a building owner can go early, right? If they want to go tomorrow, then let's let's encourage that rather than seeing a slew of people in 2025 who are all going to be like, oh, my God, I have to do this. What do I do? It's just going to overwhelm the system. Absolutely. We'll be working closely with DOB to make sure that we're providing proactive guidance to building owners. So it's a great point. Great. Um, so I, mean, I think I'm not sure where... Uh, Steve asked some of these questions. So if, if, if Council Member Levin um, asked some of these questions already, I apologize and please let me know that that happened. Um, so in the era of COVID, um, you know, respiratory imp health impacts can be compounded. Uh, what kind of health planning is there around significant construction in New York City based on, you know, the dust and, and you know, we've seen that communities of color in particular have been very hard hit by COVID. Um, but those are the same communities that are over polluted. Uh, those are the same communities where we see environmental challenges. Uh, what, you know, COVID has only sort of exasperated what we already knew is that these communities are, uh, uh, the environmental justice communities are at risk. Uh, how, what is our thought process around uh, making sure that we're, you know, dealing with those health impacts? So, Chair Councilman Levin did ask that question previously, and I know oh, okay. uh, we gave a we gave a little bit of an answer, but I think we needed a, a couple more of our experts to have a more collaborative answer. So we'll circle back. We are, you know, doing uh, learning more about it every day, and obviously there's many other factors that go into uh, the pandemic and who gets it and how. But we will circle back specific to the the air uh, monitoring and, and circle back. Okay, great. <laughs> Fantastic. I have to make sure I acknowledge, I know Councilmember Manchaka is on the, the Zoom call as well, the, the Zoom hearing. I uh, want to make sure that happens. Uh, we talked about the, we talked about MS4, I'm assuming? No, we haven't gotten oh. to it yet. Okay, so well, let's dive right in. Let's have a little fun. Um, how much pollution do industrial construction commercial sites currently discharge into the city's MS4 and natural waterways? Yes, yeah, so Mr. Chair, we have a, a permitting process for, uh, for that and uh, industrial and commercial facilities are, are regulated. Um, one of the things we're looking to do with intro 1851 is just create a unified set of, of rules uh, for both the MS4 and the CSO uh, areas so that uh, you know, everybody's, everybody's following the same uh, uniform code. And, and uh, you know, that's, that's why we're pushing forward on this one. Okay, and what measures, if any, does the city undertake to mitigate the, the flushing of uh, street liner, you know, street litter into the local waterways into MS4 as well? Yeah, so, um, as you know, we, uh, this Department of Sanitation has their sweet street sweeping uh, program that they do. 
um, and they monitor various streets for how often uh, that they, they, they feel and they have cleanliness scores. But um, DEP also has a very aggressive and we've, we've bolstered it, um, you know, in the last few years under your leadership is cleaning catch basins. So we're, we're, we're removing um, far more material, doing many more inspections than we've ever done in the past. And, and that certainly uh, helped to keep that material that otherwise might have, uh, you know, been flushed through the sewer system into local waterways uh, out. Is the reduction, do we see, uh, with the reduction of the ultimate side parking based on COVID, do we see additional street litter getting into our waterways? We haven't yet. And, you know, we, we monitor our waterways all the time. We have, uh, you know, vessels out periodically and, and we, we actually report to the state. We have a, a score of, uh, of, of litter getting into the waterways. We, we haven't noticed anything yet, but it may be, just be too early. Okay. Um, what sort of, give me an example of, you know, private and public entities that will be subject to new permits under 1851. Right, so, so under 1851, Mr. Chair, um, we're, we're looking to unify the, the stormwater rule. And, and basically, uh, DEC a few years ago came out with regulations for the municipal separate storm sewer system. Those are areas of the city where there's uh, two pipes in the street, one for sanitary sewage and one for storm flow. Um, and, and so those regulations went into effect, but that the other areas of the city served by the combined sewer system uh, did not have those rules. And so basically, um, you know, having two sets of, of regs created a disparity in, you know, how New Yorkers are treated based upon where they live. So, um, you know, what we're trying to do with 1851 is unify the rules so that um, developers, contractors uh, all, all live by one set of standards. That makes sense. Um, how much pollution does industrial construction, uh, construction commercial sites currently dis well, I think I asked that question already. Uh, can you quantify the benefits this bill will have? Yeah, so so if you you know we we certainly think by having um, developers contractors uh, in the combined sewer areas now abide by these statewide MS four rules um, and 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 after eighteen fifty one uh, becomes a local law we, we will go through the rule the rulemaking process but um, we think by by having uh, developers meet the standards um, that were otherwise being met in the MS4 area, it'll, it'll help uh, improve harbor water quality for sure, uh, but also local flooding. We think by having less stormwater coming off of those developed sites onto the street, um, we'll, we'll certainly reduce flooding during heavy storms. And you know, are we gonna be using DEP staff to implement and coordinate compliance? Is there gonna be other agencies involved? Do we have the resources to make sure that we are ensuring compliance. It's always great to pass a bill, but unless we making sure that if there's compliance, you know, it's just, it's on paper, right? It's a nice theory, but how do we make sure that we're actually educating owners about what's going on, the construction sites, and then making sure this is actually happening? Who's going to yeah, do so that work? So the thought is that during the rulemaking, we'll pass some permitting fees that will help offset the cost for DEP staff to do this. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, I am done with questions. Are there any, some, I guess I'll pass it back to Samara to see if there are any of my colleagues who have questions. Has anyone raised their hand or does anyone wish to ask a question on the bills being heard today? Council member Levin raised his hand, Costa. He has a question. I will then pass it back to uh, Council Member Levin. Thank you, Council Member Levin. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I just, I, I did want to just Sorry. ask a few more, um, <clears throat> a few more questions about um, uh, the, just some of the aspects of, of um, excuse me, sorry. Um, uh, how DEP and DOB work together around uh, air quality management on um, construction sites. And so is there, is there a, um, just as, as institutionally, how do the agencies engage and are there, are there ways to improve that engagement? That's a question for both agencies. Melanie, you want to start or you want me to start? I'll, I'll let you start, Annie. Thank you. Okay. 
No, I mean, we, we, we have regular conversations and we're both plugged into each other's, uh, you know, permitting and approval processes. Um, you know, we, we had brief conversations in the last you know, several months uh, about um, coordinating boiler uh, uh, approvals, but we, we regularly communicate with each other. I mean, of course, you know, we can always uh, Im improve our processes, uh, you know, but I think as far as construction noise is concerned, um, you know, DEP is aware of where there are major projects going on. Um, and, and, you know, if, if there are changes, uh, we, we're, we're plugged in um, where contractors have to submit a construction noise mitigation plan to DEP, uh, DOB is um, looped into that as well, so. Yeah, I agree with the, with Vinny, obviously, I would just add, uh, you know, every day we are uh, uh, handling matters that in some cases overlap, in some cases run parallel, so you know, it's noise, it's asbestos. DEP is certainly a member of our code committee uh, uh, and part of our code revision process, which obviously does impact other parts of construction, certainly impacts their work, and generally speaking, uh, impacts uh, our ability to move forward as a, a more sustainable city. So we are uh, very often uh, engaged together. Um, does DEP consider the cumulative impact um, that uh, issuing numerous uh, permits can have on a given community? So, if the, is is there a way to to it, it, does DEP kind of um, assess a neighborhood impact um, in terms of air quality when it relates to construction? Um, I, I, I would say no, but I, I, Angela Licata, if you've got anything to add. Sure. Yeah. It, you know, that is probably something that our code doesn't address. And we have in the past, particularly at Greenpoint, looked at an aggregate load analysis. Um, we were looking at, you know, what does it mean when you have significant air quality issues and then you couple that with noise and then you add to that you know something else um, maybe storm water loading so it was very very difficult um, to really have that turn into some type of mathematical formula that then you know gave you a satisfactory result um, that is something that is typically more of a city planning function when they look at a rezoning per se and look at the potential for the impacts um, as part of the environmental review process. So that is then more of a predictive tool than an actual, you know, let's follow what's happening on the ground. But what we do instead is if, if, if I may just um, place more emphasis on it's a site by site analysis. So if we find that each site is complying with codes, air, noise, asbestos, and the like, then we, you know, we presume that there isn't this sort of aggregate impact on the community. Um, and if, if we need to look at that um, more closely, we can, but that's the approach that we've been taking through the codes. Okay. I mean, it's certainly something that we should probably um, uh, work on together. And I'm, you know, we have a limited amount of time left. I have a little limited le le time left on the council, but it's certainly something that um, we would love to work on with with DEP and city planning and um, uh, any other agency um, at involving the, the community, which, which does lead me to one uh, some of the legislation that we're also considering that's not being heard today um, has to do with how uh, the community can be involved in um, in this enforcement um, and you know beyond just calling three one one, which which um, you know, it's it's uh, it's hard for communities to feel like that's an effective uh, way to be engaged when they, you know, that when it, it's 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 um, you know when they repeatedly don't see um, the type of action that uh, is required. And so, 
um, you know, we would love to work, I think, as a community with the city agencies to um, first off, you know, hopefully through legislation, but also on a, on a broader level of how we can have the public involved in um, in the monitoring itself. The public is the ones that are, you know, the people are, are seeing it themselves, that they're um, expressing concerns, um, you know, all the time about it. Yeah, happy, happy to work with the committee on that one, certainly. Okay, um, and then just last question, just, um, and this is, could be for Department of Health as well. Are there um, the particular impacts to children that we've identified with different particulate matter? Other than just there, I mean, we know that there's, um, uh, you know, as increased asthma where there's, um, you know, along major roadways and, and and things like that. But are there other, uh, what are the other health impacts, particularly children that we've identified? Well, it would depend on the particular construction, um, certainly particulates in the air um, from not just um, a fuel, such as PM2.5, but also wood dust could be, any kind of dust can be a trigger for respiratory issues. Um, depending on whether there are other chemicals present, if there's any kind of remediation going on, any kind of adhesives, anything like that, that could also be a um, issue if there were significant air levels. Um, it's, it's hard to say simply because some construction sites are a little different. Uh, we don't like to see dust in the streets. That's not our, we don't enforce that, but we certainly do indoors. Um, indoor construction is what the health department would focus on and the impacts from dust, which could include lead, asbestos, um, and other um, other adhesives or volatile chemicals that could be inside after indoor construction. This is Costa. Costa. I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Hi, so you, I, I just wanted to show you don't answer questions. I'm sorry. Got through all the questions. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. <laughs> so, sorry, Councilor Eleven. It's still getting adjusted to uh, the new the new normal of these hearings. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Are there any other Samara? Are there any other council members who wish to ask questions at this time? I'm not seeing. I'm not seeing anyone else raise their hand. So right. I don't believe anyone else is asking a question. Okay, so I guess then we'll. I'll, I'll thank the administration for their testimony, and um, we look forward to working with you as we continue to uh, move these bills forward. And we'll I guess we'll we'll call the next panel. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners, and stay well, stay safe, please, all of you. Thank you, you too, council member. We'll now turn to the public testimony. I would like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom and I will call on you if the three panelists have completed their testimony. Now for panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant of Arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. There is a four minute a limit on testimony. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I would now like to ask Chrissy Remind from Riverkeeper to testify 
and her testimony will be followed by Julie Welsh from SWIM, who will be followed by Andrea Parker from the Gowanus Canal Conservancy. Okay. Okay. Start in time. Go first, <laughs> I'm putting privilege. Um, hi, I'm Chris Rumine, I'm Riverkeeper Senior Project Coordinator. I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify here today. Uh, it's great to see other Hudson River water advocates out today. It's also great to see faces of folks from GEP. So thank you. Um, so folks know Riverkeeper is a member supported watchdog organization. We work to protect and restore the Hudson River. Uh, we do that with a big old toolkit of tricks, uh, whether it be our storm our uh, patrol boat and our water quality team or the increasing advocacy work that we do around sustainable development or the watchdog work that we do and collaboration we do with DEP around stormwater management programs. Uh, I want to be very clear, first and foremost, we fully support the passage of intro 1851. I know there are a number of bills going around today. We're here to testify on behalf of 1851. Um, and we're gonna agree with the recommendations of uh, folks from SWIM, but today we wanna focus our testimony on um, some crucial improvements um, to improve this bill and make it more impactful. And that improvement is to reduce the threshold of square footage for construction and post-construction to 10,000 square feet. Um, I'm gonna come back to that recommendation, but real quick, I wanna draw our focus to what we see as the impact and benefits of this bill. Um, this bill requires new development to implement stormwater management practices according to New York City Stormwater, the New York City Stormwater Design Manual. This is already required, as has been mentioned, by the commissioner uh, for the MS4 sewer area, sewage area. Um, this bill expands that to the CSS area, the combined sewer system area, which actually represents over 60% of the city. It really it, these practices, these management practices really work to move the city towards a more sustainable and just future. So for that, I do want to thank DEP for creating the opportunity for intro 1851. Um, the way it moves the city towards a more sustainable and just future through these stormwater practices is through retaining and detaining stormwater on private property and reducing stormwater to CSO, um, sorry, combined sewer overflows. Um, it also incentivizes green infrastructure uh, this green infrastructure is critical to reducing flooding at local levels and has not been mentioned yet. Um, incentivizing green infrastructure is critical because DEP is behind on their green infrastructure goals under the state's consent decree, under this consent decree that they have with the state. So just really quick to review, the benefits that we see coming from this are a reduction of combined sewer overflow, um, incentivizing green infrastructure, and also reducing localized flooding. So the impacts and the potential for this are huge. Uh, so we just wanna say the biggest thing here today is that we need to pass this as soon as possible. Every building built outside of this bill is a lost opportunity. It's a lost oppor opportunity for New York City. Um, it's a lost opportunity for areas that are potentially undergoing rezonings like Gowanus, Inwood. Um, and it's an oppor lost opportunity for the city to meet resilience goals. So we fully support this goal. Back to our recommendation, we do wanna say that the city should reduce the threshold for develop, new development to 10,000 square feet. Uh, the current threshold is at an acre, which is about 43,000 square feet. Um, and uh, that, that acreage really under the MS4 program only caught about 18 projects. So we believe that 10,000 square feet is both meaningful um, and also a manageable workload. DP themselves have said that 15,000 square feet is a manageable workload. And there is this caveat in that the city has the ability to later um, decrease that threshold through rulemaking, but we're gonna go ahead and ask the council. Time's expired. Okay, thank you. The council to re reduce that threshold uh, for them today. Uh, and yeah, we, we just really feel that that 10,000 square foot threshold is both a workhold, or excuse me, is a workload and a threshold uh, that will have the kind of impact that is both deserving of New York City and rises to meet the challenge that is climate change and rises to meet the challenge that is our current sewage crisis. 
So again, I want to thank the council for allowing me the opportunity to speak today and let you know that um, we will work with you to implement this bill and, and support it. So uh, again, my name is Chrissy Remind and you have my full testimony and contact information. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you very much. Um, and now we will hear from <clears throat> Julie Welsh and then Andrea Parker. Julie Welsh. Starting time. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Julie Welch, the program manager for Stormwater Infrastructure Matters Coalition. Thank you to the City Council Committee for Environmental Protection for the opportunity to submit this testimony in support of Intro 1851. We appreciate the work also of DEP staff to create the opportunity for 1851 and the many impacts, positive impacts that the bill will catalyze. SWIM Coalition represents 70 organizations who are dedicated to ensuring fishable, swimmable waters around New York City. Our members include youth and community development groups, environmental education and preservation organizations, recreational water users, science institutions, architectural and engineering firms, as well as citywide, regional, and national environmental organizations. The Newtown Creek Alliance, Gowanus Canal Conservancy, Bronx River Alliance, Guardians of Flushing Bay, and Riverkeeper are all SWIM Coalition members, most of whom are providing oral testimony today. Some are submitting written, and we support all of their testimony. Uh, we again reiterate what was presented by Chris Eubenline from Riverkeeper that uh, we support certainly this critical step of passing intro 1851. And we also recommend that the bill include language that calls on DEP to reduce the soil disturbance threshold on construction sites to 10,000 square feet. We understand and acknowledge the work and evaluation and considerations that DEP has already conducted to make their decision on reducing the threshold from an acre to 20,000 square feet, but we believe that a reduction to 10,000 square feet will have a far more impactful result in removing pollutants from our waters. Additionally, it would be useful for DEP to evaluate and integrate a density-based threshold into the unified stormwater rule time that they begin their consideration for that rule. We also seek to ensure that variables beyond lot size will be considered in the development of the unified rule. Elements such as high ground water table, limitations from bedrock clearance, uh, both of which we know have already presented challenges for the green infrastructures uh, program, uh, should be considered and adapted variance is allowed to address these matters. Uh, also, we believe that the, there should be considerations for a site's proximity to Superfund sites, water bodies with LTCP CSO long-term control plans, as well as impaired water bodies with pollutants of concerns. Um, additionally, if a site is deemed infeasible for certain practices, it does not mean that the uh, developer couldn't also make um, Repar not reparations, but could uh, work in another part of the watershed to reduce uh, CSO. Uh, lastly, uh, following the enactment of 1851, we urge DEP to conduct a robust, collaborative, and transparent public process for the 2021 Unified Stormwater Rule. It is vital that the public be made aware of the rule and how they can play a role in both informing it and of monitoring it on the ground on the sites that are in working to comply with the rule. While it might be a tendency just to reach out to developers and builders and those who are going to be immediately impacted, uh, waterfront communities and even upland communities have a large role to play and can provide very important in, um, input on the rule. SWIM would be happy to help facilitate the public dialogue in any way we can to support EDP's public outreach. Once again, we support 1851 with the recommendations that we listed above and look forward to its passage. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's always good to see you. Um, Samara, if you can call the, the next witness.
Can we have Andrea Parker? Yes, hi. Starting time. Uh, thank you all for providing the opportunity to give public testimony today on intro 1851. Um, I'm Andrea Parker, Executive Director of Gowanus Canal Conservancy. We advocate and care for ecologically sustainable parks and public spaces in the Gowanus Lowlands while empowering a community of stewards. And I'm gonna join um, Chrissy and Julie in urging City Council to pass intro 1851. We see tremendous potential for the unified stormwater rule to mitigate the sewer impacts of future development in the Gowanus neighborhood in particular. Um, as many of you know, we are going through a, a very large scale rezoning right now. Um, and we are concerned that without this rule, there will be additional combined sewage overflow into the canal caused by new development. Um, so we commend DEP and city council's effort thus far and do not seek to thwart this critical step in the process today, but offer the following recommendations to ensure that both the intro 1851 and the future legislation enacted through the capital process effectively mitigate CSO. So our recommendation number one, again, similar to Chrissy and Julie, is um, consider a further reduction of the soil disturbance threshold. Um, so to give a little more context in Gowanus, um, we know DEP is currently thinking about a potential 20,000 square foot threshold. That would in Gowanus mainly apply to larger low-lying waterfront sites where infiltration is likely to be infeasible. A 10,000 square foot threshold would address denser new development on smaller upland lots um, where this infiltration could happen um, and which are also often denser and will actually have more of a sewer impact. So um, I, we definitely recommend either the 10,000 square foot threshold or alternatively evaluating impacts by a density based threshold as Julie discussed. Um, we also recommend that DEP engage local stakeholders through the capital rulemaking process. Again, not just the development community, but local environmental groups and local stewards who know the, you know, the area on the ground and understand the underlying conditions. Um, so again, this collaboration and local knowledge is going to be crucial to implementing site appropriate green infrastructure that actually works. In Gowanus, we have observed numerous challenges in siting infiltration based green infrastructure particularly due to our bedrock and high groundwater table. So the 2010 green infrastructure plan requires DEP to build roughly 166 acres of green infrastructure in the Gowanus watershed, but to date only 13 acres have been built, mainly because of these constraints. So we really you know, are very excited to work with DEP and, and um, really support the development of a modified and expanded stormwater design manual um, that provides these adaptive variances to address local conditions, specifically low-lying areas with a high groundwater table, limitations with regard to bedrock clearance, superfund designated areas, and combined sewer overflow LTCP areas. But I know that there are many other local concerns and other water bodies that should be um, taken into consideration when developing the stormwater manual. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, DEP, for your leadership on this bill. And um, thank you all, Council, for letting me speak. Thank you very much for your testimony. I appreciate that. Thank you. Samara? Uh, if there are any questions, you can raise your hand now. Otherwise, <laughs> we'll go on to the next panel, which includes Lisa Bloodgood from the Newtown Creek Alliance and Edric Huang from North Brooklyn Neighbors. Time starts now. Okay. Oh. Uh, am I, can you hear me? Yes. Great. So, um, so yeah, I am Lisa Bloodgood. I am Director of Advocacy and Education with Newtown Creek Alliance. Um, I'm going to testify at the moment on 1851 and uh, reserve my testimony on uh, 142 and 143 for a little later. Um, so Newtown Creek Alliance is a community-based organization that works to restore, reveal, and revitalize Newtown Creek. We engage communities surrounding the waterway in environmental education and experiential opportunities. We advocate for community health and the restored ecosystems in and around its waters. We also support the productive future of industrial and manufacturing businesses along its shores. 
Um, and I'm going to not read my full testimony. Um, you have it submitted. I just want to reiterate what my colleagues with Riverkeeper, the Swim Coalition, and Gowanus Canal Conservancy have said. Um, their testimonies are fantastic, and I'm sure that there, you have a lot to, to read um, with, with everything that we're all saying. I do want to say, however, that um, this reduction in the uh, soil disturbance threshold is extremely important. Um, I think we're, we're taking a little bit further and asking that you consider all lot sizes. Um, and we'd be happy to talk more about that in the future, but um, each individual lot has their own unique characteristics. And in addition to you know, size, density, impacts uh, on Superfund, um, so many of the other things that were already mentioned, those unique characteristics uh, must be taken into consideration. And um, I also think that, or we think, the, uh, the CAPA process, that public engagement process is also really very critical in this, um, in this permitting process so that, yeah, the, the folks on the ground that know these areas and know the situation best are, are able to contribute to that process because then I think we really were able to get somewhere. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much. We support this legislation. We are grateful that it's being heard today. Um, and we're looking forward to the unified stormwater uh, rules and um, yeah, helping out our waterways. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. If anyone has any questions for any of the panelists, you can ask the questions now, or if not, we will move on to the next panel. Um, so, the next panel, I would like to welcome Kim Frazier of Sane Energy and John Rath of New York Geo. Uh, Samara, I'm sorry, The next one is Edric Wong. Uh, okay. Um, let's have Patrick Wong. Time starts now. Hi, good morning. Thank you for that. Uh, so my name is Edric Huang, and I'm the Community Engagement Fellow at North Brooklyn Neighbors. We're a grassroots environmental advocacy and community planning nonprofit that has worked in Greenpoint and Williamsburg for more than a quarter century. And today I'm testifying in support of intro numbers 142 and 143. So firstly, thank you again to the chair, community mem committee members, and community council for convening this hearing in support of these important bills that aim to protect the health of everyday New Yorkers from these human caused hazards in our environment. In North Brooklyn specifically, neighborhood air quality concerns date back to over a century with the emergence of smelling committees and they persist today. North Brooklyn Neighbors has worked on air quality issues since our founding and we want to share our strong support for interest number 142 and 143 as initial steps on mitigating what we see as a localized air quality crisis. In recent years, the proliferation of high-rise residential construction has added to concerns about local air, as has been mentioned already. Greenpoint and Williamsburg make up Brooklyn's Community Board 1, and for several years, we have been home to the most active construction sites in the borough. Dust clouds and other small debris particles originating from those sites are exceedingly common. Many residents, especially young children and seniors, are unable to avoid inhaling these airborne particles, which can cause lung damage and trigger respiratory ailments. New Yorkers deserve better, and breathing should not require a risk assessment. Intro 142 is a first step to ensuring that construction corporations can take responsibility for the impacts of their reckless work. If people walking the streets are in danger of inhaling a life-altering particulate, imagine what the workers would inhale. Intro 142 provides the necessary framework for accountability and an expectation that they must prevent particles from becoming airborne. Though the proposed penalty is far too modest, we still encourage the committee and full council to enact this bill and in future legislation, develop a more robust penalty program. Meanwhile, Intro 143 ensures that public health impacts are prioritized during major fire emergencies as we in North Brooklyn experienced in January, 2015. A seven alarm fire burned for days at the city storage facility on the Williamsburg waterfront, resulting in a toxic soup that hung over the neighborhood. 
our community rallied to get city agencies to take measures to protect public health through air monitoring and contaminant identification. Intro 143 will not only significantly broaden air monitoring and recording during emergencies, but will also require a website offering public access to that data. We believe enshrining these practices into law will further strengthen the city's public health efforts. Once again, thank you for the opportunity to testify and we look forward to working with the council to advance these goals. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Edric. I'm sorry I uh, didn't uh, have your name before. Again, now we're going to be hearing from Kim Frazak of Sane Energy, who will be followed by John Rath of New York Geo. I believe they're testifying on intro 1946. Time starts now. Thank you so much for uh, letting us speak at this hearing. Um, my name, I'm, I'm gonna be supporting um, 1946, um, 142 and 143. Um, my name is Kim Frachek. I'm the director of St. Energy Project we represent uh, 12,000 New Yorkers working for the past decade toward halting fossil fuels and moving our economy to 100% community owned and led renewables and holistic efficiency. Um, it's a pleasure to work with such a forward thinking city council and I thank you for your valiant efforts to address climate change as a crisis that is in our beloved waterfront city. Um, Sane Energy Project supports intro 1946. Since the inception of our organization that fought the unjust specter of pipeline in the West Village 10 years ago with the New York City Council support, St. Energy did everything we could to engage with New York City and New York State to push for renewable and sustainable alternatives to fracked gas coming into our city. The push to cash in on the fracking boom happened in neighboring Pennsylvania where many um, St. Energy Project members grew up and um, that happened really fast and fierce under Michael Bloomberg's leadership, who we perceived as most interested in squashing any alternatives to gas so that Wall Street, um, Michael Bloomberg's playground, could flourish from the extraction, poison, and corporate bullying of our friends and family in Pennsylvania. We knew that we faced serious barriers to having access to renewable alternative ways of regulating temperature in our homes and cooking our food. And we advocated for biodiesel inside the New York City Clean Heat Program to prevent expensive boiler conversions where costs would inevitably be passed on to renters in an already growing economically inaccessible city. Uh, we saw biofuel as a city spent cooking oil as a holistic approach to preventing waste and supplying fuel. Unfortunately, fracked gas won, and we've been seeing major expansions ever since then, most currently two blocks from my home in North Brooklyn. Uh, with a new national grid transmission pipeline that's unnecessarily unnecessary, costly, dirty, and dangerous that we urge you to stand with us against a halt. Today's Sane Energy Project is involved with several campaigns to halt the use of fracked gas in our city, and we've identified even more barriers as time goes on. The education and information about alternatives is, readily, is not readily available on purpose. That is why we are 100% supporting intro 1946 and thank you for this work. Other barriers we have identified in our advocacy work, especially as parties in the corporate utility rate cases is that the corporate utility model has a number one interest in making profit for shareholders, not supporting our community needs, public health and safety and climate action first. Additional barriers we have, uh, we want to put on the council radar. Um, I list a number of them in my testimony, which I've emailed um, that are slanted towards um, pushing for uh, a gas future, um, lobbying financial incentives, the 100 foot rule that mandates that people get subsidies for hooking up gas. We would love to see a fracked gas city, uh, fracked gas free city in New York City and pass legislation that makes it illegal for any new development to install gas. Thank you for the movement towards this common goal. And we look forward to continuing to work with you to ensure the mayor's call for halting all fossil fuel infrastructure in a state of the city address um, to take place on the ground and not just in media friendly announcements as we see National Grid's North Brooklyn MRI fracked gas pipeline and LNG expansion proposals continues despite this announcement. Uh, regarding 142 and 143 are because of this pipeline 
uh, construction, our, our neighborhoods from Brown has expired. Okay, thank you. Well, Kim, thank you. And uh, I, I agree with you. We're at a moment where uh, we have to recognize that we have to move quicker, right? I mean, we have to implement and uh, tie these processes together. Right. If, if we don't strike now to bring more renewable energy into New York City, right, and to start turning away, you know, to start changing our infrastructure, you know, we're not going to have that opportunity later, right? Like every day we waste is a, is an opportunity missed. So I, I I appreciate the work that you guys are doing, and I definitely look forward to partnering with you as we definitely evaluate, you know, in, in the, I think what, today is August, you know, 14th. So I think I have just about 16 and a half months left as a council member. In those 16 months, I think we need to make sure that we are implementing and, uh, you know, sort of making these processes more streamlined to have, uh, you, know, fossil, you know, fossil infrastructure not be the primary or the easiest thing to do I, I've said this more, I've said this so many times at hearings, I'll say it one more time. If we can make it as easy to go green as it is to be traditional, then people can make choices based on their values. But if it's difficult, and if the fossil fuel you know, infrastructure has a leg up, then people are gonna choose the easier technology. Maybe not even the best cost-effective one, but they're gonna pick the one that's not gonna take them years to implement. Um, so I think we definitely need to make sure that we are leveling the playing field over the next seven, 16 and a half months. So thank you. Thank you. And now we'll hear from John Rath, please. Time starts now. <sighs> good, good, good morning, Samara, and good morning, Chair Constantinides. Uh, I'm Director of Operations for New York Geothermal Association. Uh, we represent drillers, manufacturers, and installers of, of heat pumps, geothermal heat pumps across the state. And I have to say, in my year now being with New York Geo, one of the most commonly brought up things is awareness of fossil fuel alternatives by, by building owners, uh, by building managers, homeowners for sure, and even elected officials. So uh, we also hear that across the country from our allied uh, geothermal organizations. And uh, it, is, it is one of the key things that I think uh, number 1946 will do, which is continue the awareness and the education process as long as it's accurate information. And that's really important for us because there can be a lot of myths and misinformation that we can pick up. Uh, I'll also say that our New York GEO members are anxious and willing to help the Department of Buildings spread the word uh, about efficiency and renewable energy uh, whenever you need us. So thanks again for the opportunity. I I can comment, I'd like to, on number 1982, but if this isn't the time, I'll wait. Um, it's, that, it's most certainly the time. Okay. If, okay. If, you have, if you have more, you have two minutes and 20 seconds. If, that, <laughs> if you had a moment, this is it, my friend. Okay, I'll, I'll take advantage. Um, my understanding uh, with this issue of marginal emissions, um, and, and I want to respectfully disagree with what I read number 1982 to be. Um, and for a couple reasons. I guess the first one is that in my research, in reality, gas powered fuel cells are really not intermittent. They're continuously operated. So that's something I think that's really important. And as a result of that, uh, I would like to recommend looking at not marginal emission status, but um, average emissions. I, I think there's a great possibility that really clean stuff like wind and solar could uh, get de-emphasized with 
if marginal emissions are used for fuel cells. And at the same time, I'm a little bit scared that it opens the door to other fossil fuel electricity generation, perhaps diesel and other things that we really don't need and don't want uh, at this time in our, in our state's uh, desire to get cleaner uh, air. So uh, I appreciate the time to, to talk with you and, and I'll concede the rest of my time. Thank you very much. Next, unless there are additional questions, um, thank you, uh, John, and thank you, Kim, very much. Um, we will next call Bob Wyman and um, Scott Frank of ACEC, who will testify on intro 1982. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bob Wyman. I'm a resident of the Upper West Side. I'd like to say it is a mystery to me that the New York City Council is giving serious attention to Intro 1982. It's a bill that will increase gas consumption and gut both the spirit and usefulness of Local Law 97-2019. Gas use in New York City's buildings today already produces close to 150 percent of the total greenhouse gas emissions that will be permitted from all sources in 2050. Thus, the primary focus of the city council should be on reducing gas use, not increasing it. We cannot achieve our emission reduction goals without a dramatic reduction in gas use. It's time to start now. Local Law 97 established limits on emissions and penalties for buildings that do not reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. But passage of this bill will make a mockery, a joke, of both those requirements and the penalties. If passed, this bill will credit any building which installs a gas-powered fuel cell with hundreds of pounds of emissions reductions for every megawatt hour of electricity generated. Thus, we should anticipate that many dirty buildings will choose to avoid penalties by simply installing gas-powered generators instead of actually improving their efficiency or selecting non-emitting energy sources. Intro 1982 will create a windfall bounty for the fuel cell industry, but it will be very bad for New York and for the climate. An always-on, non-dispatchable gas power generator is not a marginal producer. If anything, it should be considered part of baseload production. One might provide some credit to these things if fuel cells were much more efficient than gas-powered baseload generators, but even Bloom Energy, a major manufacturer of fuel cells, acknowledges that its fuel cells normally operate at about 50% efficiency. Thus, they are less efficient than a modern combined cycle gas plant and much less efficient than either cogen or CHP systems. And if New York City adopts the CO2 equivalence rules required by the CLCPA, we will soon find that fuel cells produce more greenhouse gas emissions than generators powered by ultra-low sulfur diesel, number two. If reducing emissions is our goal, we should actually prefer the installation of oil power generators rather than gas-powered systems. That, of course, doesn't sound like it makes sense. Whatever Intro 1982 says... We don't have official vetted marginal emissions data or forecasts for Zone J. The best data we do have shows, uh, which is discussion only data issued by NISO in 2018, shows that in Zone J, marginal emissions are highest from 10 a.m. in the morning till about 9 p.m. in the evening. Also, marginal emission, emissions are highest in February, July, and August. Of course, daytime in July and August are precisely the periods during which solar power is at peak production. And at night and during the winter is when wind energy production peaks. Thus, if we really want to reduce marginal emissions, we should be encouraging zero emissions production from solar and wind during peak periods, not more highly emitting gas-powered production. Instead of rewarding a technology that even Bloom Energy says will produce about 789 pounds of emissions per megawatt hour produced, why not encourage zero emission technologies during periods of peak marginal um, emissions? Encouraging gas power generators will not only result in higher emissions than if we encourage solar, wind, or even oil power generators, it will also make it harder for us to avoid accumulating stranded assets in our gas network. I could go on, but time's limited. Uh, at this point, let me repeat what I, that, there, uh, that we have no regularly maintained source of marginal emissions factors for either New York State as a whole or for Zone J. Thus, even if intro 1982 were a good idea, 
the data needed to implement it is simply not available. Fuel cells used in New York City, um, where, where, where we enjoy some of the cleanest electricity in our country, won't reduce emissions. The reality is that intro 1982 modifies the provision that was buried deep in local law 147, 2019, as a way to effectively neutralize the effect of local law 97. That Mine loophole should be struck. That loophole should be struck or repealed, not modified. This is bad law based on bad or non-existent science. It will benefit no one other than equipment manufacturers. It is not the right thing for the New York City Council to do at this time. Um, I'd also like to say, if I could, that I support the uh, 1942 concerning providing information to uh, 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 people at the time of inspections. Any, any opportunity we have to inform people of opportunities to, to uh, uh, do cleaner things is a good thing. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And now we'll hear from Scott Frank. Scott, would you please? Time starts Here's now. your testimony now. Thank you, Chair and Council Members. Uh, I'm Scott Frank. I'm a licensed professional engineer. I'm a managing partner with the engineering firm Jarl, Spahm, and Bowles. I'm also the Energy Committee Chair for the American Council of Engineering Companies, Companies, an organization representing more than 300 engineering firms throughout New York State with a concentration in New York City. I'm also the Board Chair of the Urban Green Council, a substantial nonprofit whose mission is to transform New York City buildings through a, for a sustainable future. And I'm also an appointee uh, to the Local Law 97 Advisory Board. Today I'm testifying in opposition to intro 1982. I want to first say that I agree fully with the testimony we just heard from Mr. Wyman. So thank you for that testimony. I'm going to take a few minutes, a few seconds of my time to eliminate what I wonder might be some misperception uh, by our policymakers about what fuel cells really are and are not. On the face of it, fuel cells are a virtuous technology. They combine hydrogen and oxygen, two safe and abundant elements on our planet, to create electricity, with the only byproduct being water. You can literally drink from the tailpipe of a fuel cell. The challenge, however, in the commercialization of fuel cells is the source of hydrogen. Hydrogen is not just readily available uh, as, a, as a supply to, to be injected into, into fuel cells. The industry in the United States and abroad is standardized on the fossil fuel natural gas as the source of hydrogen for these products. The inconvenient truth about this economic enterprise reality is that in separating hydrogen from methane, the molecule in natural gas, carbon is released. And carbon is combined with oxygen to create CO2. In this way, fuel cells generate carbon emissions at essentially the same rate as all other conventional cogeneration or on-site generation systems. There is no fun free lunch here. There is no virtuous aspect of the commercialization of these products in New York City and in New York City buildings. So there is no advantage from a carbon emission standpoint for deploying fuel cells in lieu of any other conventional distributed generation or cogeneration system. Cogeneration is already readily accommodated within Local Law 97 and within the rulemaking process that is now underway. Intro 1982 is a continuation of the inappropriate preferential treatment already given to the fuel cell sector from local law 147 of, 19, uh, of 2019, as already mentioned several times. It does this by misapplying analysis reporting that is provided by NYSERDA in an effort to remove medium-term business risk from the fuel cell enterprise activity. In this way, it sends an inappropriate signal to the market that New York City is open for business for this carbon emitting, carbon emitting form of cogeneration. It will increase demand for natural gas within the five boroughs, very opposite of the direction we need to take. Further, 
1982 undermines the role of the Local Law 97 Advisory Board and the New York City Department of Buildings and the comprehensive rulemaking process that is now underway as prescribed in the law by signaling that special interests can further their agendas by chipping, chipping away at the integrity of Local Law 97 through the lobbying process. This intro should be withdrawn and consistent with the previous speaker, the clause of preferential treatment. Time has expired. Local Law 147 should be removed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Dana Schneider of the Real uh, Empire State Realty Trust, who will be followed by Jeffrey Sanoff. Time starts now. Hello, this is Dana Schneider. I'd like to give my position to Tony Malkin, who is on the call. Please, if you could unmute Tony. He's called out as Anthony E. Malkin. <sighs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I'm Anthony Malkin, the chairman, CEO, and president of Empire State Realty Trust, a publicly traded real estate investment trust that owns office and retail in New York City and the greater New York metropolitan area, the leader in sustainability and energy efficiency. According to a study by Morgan Stanley, we have the lowest carbon output per square foot of any publicly traded New York City-based real estate investment trust. I also chair the Sustainability Policy Advisory Committee of the Real Estate Roundtable. And our work at the Empire State Building is the most famous uh, example of energy retrofits in the world. Uh, I'm the sole real estate commercial real estate owner on the advisory board for the implementation of Local Law 97. I appear today to speak against the proposed 1982 uh, legislation. Local Law 97 is the most severe, stringent, broad reaching and poorly researched climate bill of the United States, if not the world. Passed without adequate consultation with experts, it is a broad based expression of policy without roots in practice. There is no more comprehensive goal set by any city in the United States, by the way. There is one critical aspect to Local Law 97 upon which the success or failure of the entire bill rests, the, the creation of an advisory board for the implementation of Local Law 97. This stakeholder and advisory board process has been charged with the hard technical work required to address the implementation of all aspects of the law. Included in the law, is work to be done to set the greenhouse gas equivalent factor for all distributed generation. Distributed generation includes all types of technology that generates heat and electricity in and for buildings, and that includes fuel cell technology. The proposed uh, 1982 is an attempt to undermine the entire process of the determination of greenhouse gas equivalent factors required under the bill. Local on 97 is not complete until the technical and engineering work required by, the, uh, by it is performed by the advisory board and the report of the advisory board is delivered to the Department of Buildings and the Department of Buildings processes that report, performs its rulemaking as required by the bill from that report. That said, specifically, exceptions and COTE determinations are specifically listed as responsibilities of the advisory board. Separate from this, uh, the flaw in this process, uh, and the defeat of objectives set forth by Local Law 97, I will focus on this simple fact. The marginal emissions factor set by NYSERDA may or may not make sense for this purpose. Based on the known facts, NYSERDA's marginal energy emissions are an average statewide value, not a zone J measurement. That said, marginal emission factors are dynamic, change hourly, daily, and seasonally. We should be clear, we should do our work, not take shortcuts. There are established Local Law 97 working groups tasked with the determination of protocol process and technical advice for carbon uh, efficiency, coefficients, 2029 and beyond. It asks the question, why do the sponsors of Local Law 97 suggest special treatment for natural gas fuel cells over other types of distributed energy resources? Why do the sponsors of Local Law 97 wish to send a market signal that the process they set forth can be corrupted. And why should that process of corruption come from them? 
what special interest is served by this legislation? Or is this just a bad idea that our informed testimony can stop? It has been noted by me before and covered in the press by others that New York City has an opportunity to prove how decarbonization works or that it does not work. It is critical to implement a public process driven by research and technical calculation. And that is for what Local Law 97 provides. Let the Implementation Advisory Board do its work. At the end of that process, there will certainly be a comprehensive view that may suggest amendments to be made at that time. That said, the end around move suggested by 1982 is wrong, flawed, and should not be allowed. Time has expired. Thank you. If there are no questions of the, of the two panelists or the one panelist, um, then we'll move on and we now will call Kim Smith, who will be followed by Sonal Jesse and then Cecil Corbin Moore, all of we at to testify. Time starts now. Hello? Hey, hello? Yes, sir, we hear me? you. Can you hear me? Oh, sorry. Um, uh, on, uh, which one is think, it? Jeffrey was next, I think. Um, Kim, you can't hear Kim Smith? I think I was the next speaker. Yes, uh, Jeffrey, please uh, go. Kim, you're, you're following Jeffrey. Okay, no worries. Thank you. Okay. First of all, I'd like to thank the committee for allowing me to testify today on behalf of Community Board 13, which is in southern Brooklyn, Coney Island, Gravesend, Brighton Beach, and Seagate. Uh, I would like to testify on the intro 142 and 143, which I agree with and which the Community Board agrees with. I would also like to expand that intro so that the ambient air quality report should be sent to the community board because we have no knowledge of what's going on in our community. For an example, the wind shelter was built on top of toxic material, which was a dye factory. They also had to have an asbestos abatement program over there. None of this was the, none of this was talked about by the community board. There is a, a a junior high school, Mark Twain High School, which was about 200 yards away from the wind shelter, and we have no idea of what the abatement program was involved with. We did call for an independent study or audit on the project, but we never got any answers. We also called for an independent study for the air quality in Coney Island. Mr. Levin spoke about the EJ in North Brooklyn. I think Coney Island and its, and its area around it is also an EJ area. We've had various excavations from sewer lines by DDC and I had asked at various interagency meetings about the ambient air quality that was being dug up. I never got any report from them. It's like, we're not there. We're stepchildren. Uh, I think that the certification of these air quality reports are being done self-certified. And like President Reagan said at one time, Trust but verify. And I think that we should be able to verify what the DEP is reporting as far as the ambient air quality. Secondly, I'd like to know how many inspectors does DEP have, the resources, and what type of equipment they bring to the site to report on the data 
on the particulates that are in the air. Since Superstorm Sandy, the residents of Coney Island and, and relating areas have called what we call a Coney cough. People, children, and even animals are suffering because of the non-compliance, uh, as I believe, of these developers. They don't live in the area, they build their projects, and then they leave. We're the ones who suffer. If you remember this tragic, uh, the tragedy of 9-11, people are suffering now after almost 20 years, and we don't know what's gonna be taking place in the future for our children, adults, and even our animals. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey and Anthony, for your insightful testimony. And now we will move on to the WEAC panel that I previously announced. Kim Smith, Sonal Jesse, and then Cecil Corbel Mark. Time starts now. Ms. Smith is on mute. Good day. I would like to thank the Committee on Environmental Protection and the sponsors of intro number 142. And I would like to thank WEAC for inviting me to testify in support of intro number 142. My name is Kim Smith, chair of the Ennis Francis Houses Extermination and Construction Committee. The committee was formed in October of 2016 in anticipation of a very large construction project in central Harlem that faces directly in front of our complex that has a total of 220 units. Many of the Ennis Francis residents suffer from asthma, bronchitis, and other respiratory illnesses. Um, grave concerns about the potential health risks related to construction airborne contaminants of asbestos, mold, and dust prompted us to organize early and meet regularly with the developer and several community stakeholders. In April of 2019, the interior demo of 10 low-rise buildings on the construction site, built in 1984, was underway. The construction workers tossed mold contaminated sheetrock and other construction debris out of the windows. Dust literally covered residents' windows, window sills, and furniture. You can all imagine just how concerned and outraged we were. We had no idea what was in the dust. We wondered, is there asbestos or other cancer-causing um, particles in the dust? We contacted Councilman Bill Perkins, we act, and other local elected officials for their help. Fast forward one year later on April 6, 2020, in the midst of the COVID-19 quarantine, where all non-essential construction was prohibited, the developer demolished nine of the low-rise buildings. The buildings were not wet prior. The buildings were simply bulldozed, and as a result, residents scurried to close their windows as dust clouds filled the community. We immediately contacted WEAC, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, who subsequently contacted the Department of Buildings, who shut the construction site down for illegally demolishing the buildings. The construction dust atrocities that occurred directly in front of our Occupy complex underscores the importance of intro number 142. It is crucial that the bill has um, a detailed dust mitigation plan with language that is easy for lay people of the community to understand. Additionally, there should be a very strong enforcement component, in my opinion, in the bill. Because despite our tireless advocacy efforts as residents to prevent environmental injustices, the developer had no fear of retribution for illegally demolishing nine buildings in the midst of the coronavirus quarantine in the Harlem community where residents historically suffer disproportionately with respiratory illnesses. I'm hopeful that intro num number 142 can be used as an effective tool to combat some of the unfortunate 
construction practices associated with gentrification and poor communities throughout New York City. Thank you so much. Again, my name is Kim Smith and thank you for the opportunity. Can we hear from Salal Jessup? Time starts now. Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Consentinides, members of the committee. Thanks for the opportunity to testify, testify regarding these bills uh, being heard today. My name is Sonal Jessel. I'm the Policy and Advocacy Coordinator at We Act for Environmental Justice. Over the past 32 years, We Act has been combating environmental racism in Northern Manhattan. I myself have received my Master in Public Health from Columbia University. I'm here as an advocate concerned about the communities we serve in Northern Manhattan, which is heavily Black, African American, and Latinx, low income, hard hit by COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm testifying in support really of what uh, we heard from Ms. Smith just now and the increasing efforts of the city to properly monitor air quality and ultimately reduce air pollution in our neighborhoods. Uh, air pollution has been a major issue in New York City for a long time, especially with WE Act. One of the most notable campaigns was to address poor air quality from diesel exhaust in Harlem that was leading to astronomically high rate asthma rates in Black African American children, particularly. At that time, in the 90s, an EPA study of Northern Manhattan found that it had more than 200% higher PM 2.5 than the standard at the time. And in the early 2000s, about one in four children in Harlem had asthma. So it was a really big issue. And due to the hard work of activists, advocates um, here in New York City, air quality is dramatically improved for all these neighborhoods. However, it's still not the same uh, across neighborhoods and there's low income communities of color who are still dealing with the brunt of poor air quality, um, leading to negative health impacts such as asthma, cardiovascular disease. Uh, East Harlem, for example, has twice the rate of childhood hospitalizations for asthma compared to the New York City average. Um, it's, a, it's important to continue to address air pollution as a major public health issue, particularly the urgency has increased as many research studies around the world have found that people exposed to poor air quality over the lifespan and people with respiratory illness tend to have more severe cases of COVID-19, particularly that is people living in low-income communities of color. New York deals with a diverse soup of air pollution and all efforts to monitor these sources and mitigate its dispersal is vital for the health of our communities. Um, such as what you heard from Ms. Smith's testimony. So we act is here not in support just of 142, but also 143, a local law to amend the administrative code of New York City to the creation of emergency ambient air quality monitoring programs, especially after the fires. Um, it, it's vital to measure the level of air pollution that are hazardous to human health, and it makes that information publicly available so that people like organizations like us and the public and other uh, relevant organizations, community members can understand who's being most impacted and its many sources and we can better target um, how to improve air quality for people. So it's important to act fast to address our climate environmental crisis, both for the immediate health of our communities that have chronically dealt with poor air quality and high asthma rates and for the future of our city that's already seeing the impacts of climate change with extreme heat event, more frequent hurricanes, so monitoring our sources of air pollution is extremely important. That's why I'm testifying in support of introduction 143. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Cecil Corbin Mark, please. Time starts now. Cecil, you there? Yes. I, ah, now I couldn't unmute myself. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Cecil Corbin Mark. I'm the Deputy Director of We Act for Environmental Justice. And I'm really proud of our member, Kim Smith, and my colleague, Sonal Jessel, for their testimonies. We are a membership organization in Northern Manhattan with a little, uh, just about a thousand members, primarily of residents uh, living in the community boards that make up Northern Manhattan. I'll start out by saying if our society is going to solve the climate crisis, one of the things we must do is stop burning gas in our buildings. Um, today's bill, Intro 1946, is intended to make sure that the city is providing assistance to building owners that makes them aware of the options available to them to get off gas proactively. 
We Act supports the idea of making sure that, of making sure that building owners know more about energy efficiency, um, but it also seeks to ensure that building owners get information about alternatives to gas usage in their buildings for cooking, hot water, and heating. In particular, We Act believes that owners should get information about changing gas ranges for electric induction stoves. Installing solar hot water heating systems instead of using gas to provide hot water and installing air source heat pumps for heating and cooling. I'd like to focus on the use of gas for cooking in the home and the health challenges that are associated with uh, the pollutants that are often thrown off by gas stoves. The use of gas stoves uh, in our buildings, especially residential buildings in New York City, are not only causing harm to the climate, it is also harming the health of tens of thousands of New York City residents. For more than a decade, a growing body of scientific evidence has shown that gas stoves throw off pollutants like nitrogen dioxide and carbon monoxide. When people cook, those invisible pollutants can easily reach levels that would be illegal outdoors, but the Clean Air Act does not regulate indoor air quality. Scientists linked gas stoves to asthma attacks and hospitalizations. In 2008, Johns Hopkins Cecil, we lost you. We can't hear you, brother. Can't hear you. Now? I can hear Hello? you. Hello? Yes, I hear you now. Oh, okay. Um, so I was saying scientists linked gas stoves to asthma attacks and hospitalizations. In 2008, John Hopkins scientists urged doctors to advise parents of asthmatic children to get rid of their gas stoves or at least install powerful exhaust hoods. Asthma is a rampant discriminatory disease hitting children and communities of color around the city the hardest, and the current COVID-19 pandemic has only exacerbated these health disparities. Nitrogen uh, dioxide is one of the main culprits, and uh, in the absence of a vaccine for the COVID-19 crisis, uh, sorry, COVID, uh, coronavirus 19, our primary public health tool is to require that people stay at home where possible. And the battery of studies that have emerged in more, in, in, in more than the last decade, we know that gas stoves in the home are exacerbating ex respiratory illnesses, especially in young children. Given the high rates of respiratory illnesses in communities of color and EJ communities, and in light of the absence of regulations on the quality of indoor air, getting gas stoves out of multifamily affordable residential buildings is an imperative, not only for the climate, but also for the health of residents. We Act urges the Council to consider amending Intro 1946 to require that the City provide information to building owners about eliminating gas stove ranges for electric induction stoves. Similarly, we urge the Council to require information about solar hot water heating and air source heat pumps be provided. Um, we also believe that uh, uh, solar hot water heating and air source heat pumps be provided to building owners. Our city now has local law 97 and our state now has the climate leadership and community protection. Time has expired. Does anyone have any questions for Cecil or Sonal or Kim? Seeing no questions, we can move on to the next panel. Is there a question? No, no, just thanking them for their testimony that I did with the other panels. Okay, let's go to the other panels then. We have um, six more witnesses. Um, Malahika Israel, Shannon Clear, and Rebecca Pryor would like to testify. Um, can we have those parties testify now? Um, we only have Shannon Clear, so we'll start with them. Hi, thank you for- Starting time. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak and thank you all for your community, for your service to your community. I'm here to speak in favor of introduction number 142. 
I live in North Greenpoint where the bell slip buildings among others have been, have been and are being built. There are also numerous smaller homes and businesses being demolished to make way for larger apartment buildings. The dust and debris mitigation at these sites is wo woefully insufficient. Contractors are increasingly using styrofoam insulation at these smaller sites. However, the styrofoam is rarely the right size for the job. So they cut it and carve it outdoors, creating snowstorms of toxic material throughout the entire neighborhood. In one instance at the construction site on Manhattan Avenue between Freeman and Eagle, a contractor brought, ins bought insulation that was too thick. Rather than exchange it for the right size, workers with no masks sanded the insulation, contaminating the entire neighborhood for blocks on end. This went on all day. An actual snowstorm of toxic styrofoam was allowed to fall on the main street of Greenpoint and nothing was done. The construction site at, at 1122 Manhattan Avenue, which is next door to my apartment, used styrofoam insulation off and on for months as well. They were sawing it on sidewalks and scaffoldings with no mitigation. Our entire building was contaminated. I spent hours cleaning styrofoam from the building hallway, stairway, and throughout my entire home over and over again for months on end. Our air conditioner was ruined and the owners claimed they would come and clean the roof, but never did. Although they did splatter it with concrete sealants and enough construction dust to contaminate our entire garden. Whenever they were reported to the DEP, they knew immediately and would have someone come and start vacuuming the largest piles of debris around the building or simply shut down until after the DEP, DEP inspector came. Regardless of what the DEP said or did, it was not enough to get this site to stop contaminating the air with styrofoam insulation for month after month after month. These examples of contamination from smaller scale construction sites are being replicated throughout the neighborhood of Greenpoint. But is the larger construction sites that have been the most agree that have the most egregious lack of proper dust and debris containment. These sites include, but are not limited to, the bell, bell slip buildings in their neighboring sites and the Greenpoint building neighboring the India Street Ferry Dock. The dust from the Greenpoint building created dust storms when the wind came off the river. It was funneled down India Street and would actually blind you when you were in it. I caught, got caught in a large storm one day and ended up on a steroid inhaler for two weeks after that. Far worse than that was the pile of soil several stories high that was remediated where the baseball field on Commercial Street now stands. The site is across the street from the Greenpoint playground and bordered by the confluence of Newtown Creek and the East River. There was asbestos in the soil being abated according to the sign in front of the pile. It was covered only by a large tarp with sandbags intermittently placed around the bottom of the tarp. Every time there were strong winds coming off the water, which is often, the tarp lifted at the edges and the contaminated dust was blown straight onto the playground. Despite exposing the children, parents, waterways, and greenery of Greenpoint to this harmful, harmful construction dust, there were minimal, if any, fines levied against these construction companies for their contamination of our neighborhood and homes. These construction companies failed to properly mitigate their debris and the entire neighborhood is paying for it instead of them. There are many construction projects that are just beginning in our community. I ask that you please use your legislative power to pass the introduction 142 that this, so that this egregious contamination of our community does not continue moving forward. I'm expired. Thank you for your time. Uh, it looks like there are only two witnesses left. Uh, does anyone have any questions of the preceding witnesses? Um, if you do not, we have two witnesses left to be called. Steve Chester or Chesler and Francois Olivas. Steve Chesler. Okay. Starting time. Thank, thank you. Hello, Mr. Chair and council members. My name is Steve Chesler. I'm a 19 year resident of Greenpoint, Brooklyn. I'm a member of Brooklyn Community Board number one, co chair of its Environmental Protection Committee, and a part of the leadership of Friends of Bushwick in the Park and Friends of Transit Park. Thank you for holding this hearing today and pushing through the challenges of the corona pandemic to keep our government functioning and our city moving forward and for the opportunity to testify. 
Today I'm testifying in favor of amending law number uh, 142 related to helping control airborne construction dust. Spurred on by the 2005 Greenpoint Williamsburg rezoning resolution, Greenpoint has been and continues to be a hyperdevelopment epicenter in the city where at least 15 residential mega towers um, have been built or in progress along its waterfront and countless projects built or in progress upland. This is of course a part of the continuing development trend in many areas throughout the city. With this massive wave of construction has come a wave of related hazards with construction dust being a significant one. The release of styrene particles in the air has been one of the main culprits for the large influx of new residents to these neighborhoods like ours, which include many young children. This is a dangerous threat, especially if a child were to inhale these particles into their development, developing lungs, which contain suspected carcinogenic substances. I've witnessed these particles in the air and on surfaces and seen many images taken in our community of the same and of construction workers covered with them. Therefore, it's crucial this bill be amended to hold developers and construction workers accountable to protect our children and adults, both residents and construction workers. It is a must do. In relation to the bill's text related to punishment, I worry that the starting and maximum financial penalties for corporations, including the proposed revisions, are too low and will not incentivize compliance with this law, especially for mega tower developers with incredibly deep pockets. Issuance of a stop work order should be included as a penalty option and as well as much larger fines for corporations, even scaling fines up based on the size of the project to better instill fear and help promote compliance in stopping destructive practice of releasing these ha hazardous uh, substances into our air and streets. Additionally, I want to express my support of Bill Number 143 in relation to the creation of an emergency ambient air quality monitoring program. I live about a mile from where the Seven Alarm City Storage Records warehouse fire occurred over five years ago. It was incredibly disconcerting the in inadequate amount of air monitoring and, and communication regarding the state of air quality during that massive fire, which effectively acted as an impromptu trash incinerator and produced an immense plume for weeks. Incinerators are known to emit an incredible array of toxins in the air, including dioxins. But the true makeup that, of that fire's toxicity at the time was not made known. This information needs to be captured and provided in the moment of, of, of large-scale industrial type fires as they occur so government and residents can make better informed decisions. The people are ent entitled to the truth. This is an important uh, piece of legislation. And finally, I also support, uh, strongly support passage of a law in 1946 encouraging the conversion away from fossil fuel usage and creation of carbon zero replacements and alternatives to fossil fuel energy. We as a city and nation globally need to be reducing our greenhouse gas emissions now to meet IPCC goals for stabilizing the global surface temperature. We are so late and therefore are failing our children and future generations. Initiatives laid out in this bill help us get there. However, if energy and infrastructure alternatives are not robustly communicated to developers and the provisions in local 97 are not enforced, this bill will just be an empty piece of paper. Thank you, Councilman Levin and Chair Constance Anitas for sponsoring these, uh, this legislation. And thanks again, Chair and Council members for holding this hearing. Thank you. And thank you. We have three more witnesses left. If there are no questions for the previous witnesses, let's hear from Francois Olivas uh, and Margot Spindleman. Starting time. Hi, my name is Francoise Olivas. Um, I've lived in Greenpoint for 17 years in New York City for 28 years. I am a part of Friends of Transmitter Park as well as the West Street um, Community Block Association. I've been an environmental advocate and sustainable designer for a very long time and I'm here to speak on 142. I want to thank Council Member Levin and his staff for taking the taking the cries of a mother and a community and writing a law that begins to address. And when I state again, it only is the beginning of what needs to be done to the current health threat and environmental injustices that are caused by construction sites. I also want to thank Victoria Cabranes and Shannon Clare for getting into good trouble with me and standing up to construction sites that clearly are doing harm to our health and environment. I became overly aware of construction snow as a new mom. I found a moment of quiet and shade by the one blue slip construction on a hot summer day. I watched the tiny part white particles float down from the building, reminding me of that opening scene in American Beauty where the plastic flag floats into the air. 
I quickly left thinking about what it could possibly do to my daughter. Fast forward to four months of doctor's visits, ambulance rides to the ER, second opinions and specialists who wanted to do a bronchioscopy to a child under the age of one, and finally to a pediatric pulmonologist who asked point blank about the amount of construction that we live nearby and if our daughter had been exposed to that. My maternal instincts went into overdrive and I started thinking about those tiny white pellets that I see all over our neighborhood weekly. After much research, I found out that these pellets are from insulation. Depending on what type of insulation is being used, the foam when cut releases formaldehyde into the air. The construction snow not only enters our streets and air, it enters our waterways and takes a thousand years to disintegrate. Please let that sink in a thousand years. If you believe in climate change, and I hope you all do, these environmental injustices need to be recognized. Our family has the privilege of good, good health insurance and we can see incredible doctors. I know this is not the case for everyone in our city. The children in our community already suffer from high asthma rates and the lack of transparent air monitoring puts everyone at risk. We are currently in the first wave of a global pandemic that attacks the lungs and our city considers construction to be essential. The least we can do is hold the construction companies accountable. In North Brooklyn, all of our playgrounds and schools are surrounded by construction sites. Some days the parents get headaches from the air being dusty or a peculiar smell. If our air is making the adults ill, what is it doing to our children and our seniors? What are the long-term effects and how can this be measured? We need real-time air monitoring that is transparent to the citizens and is actually capable of reading what is in the air. To be frank, I don't think this law is strong enough. When I look at the fines, I see the price tag to my daughter's life to human life. My daughter's life is priceless. All human lives are priceless. I ask this committee to not only pass the law, but increase the fines on multi-million dollar developers or create a three strikes you're out fine. In my opinion, this is, only, this is the only way the developers will take this seriously. New York City can do better and we must be building for a sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, we have one witness left, Margo Spindleman. Margo, can you give your testimony now? Starting time. Um, hi, thank you for giving me the chance to speak today. My name is Margo Spindleman. I'm a Greenpoint homeowner, ratepayer, and member of the No North Brooklyn Pipeline Coalition. The No North Brooklyn Pipeline Coalition comprises nearly 20 groups from Brownsville, Bedsty, Bushwick, Williamsburg, and Greenpoint, as well as several elected officials who have publicly condemned the pipeline construction and LNG proposals. It is one of the fastest growing coalitions I've seen to date. I'm grateful to the city council for fighting with us and we are in full support of intro 1946. When our community first found out about the pipeline construction, we were shocked that no outreach had been done here looking for our consent to build this fracked gas pipeline. We reached out to our local elected officials and they also mentioned that National Grid did not fully explain the breadth of the project. National Grid claimed that the project was just a system upgrade to ensure reliability. However, it wasn't until we became active that we saw the pipeline had a larger goal to lead to a liquefied fracked gas um, facility in Greenpoint. Greenpoint residents are no strangers to fossil fuel destruction. Greenpoint is the site of the largest terrestrial oil spill in North America, where it is estimated that between 17 and 30 million gallons of oil have accumulated underneath us. We are continuing to recover from this extractive poisonous spill on the Newtown Creek, which was declared a Superfund site. We were shocked that they were proposing to expand more fossil fuels on an already compromised community that has a long history of environmental injustice. Many members in the No, no North Brooklyn Pipeline Coalition have been asking questions about why we wouldn't move to renewable sources for heating and cooling our buildings and cooking our food, considering we all worked so hard to have the landmark CLCPA climate legislation passed in New York City and New York State. Our investigations and research led us to see one of the barriers to moving our economy to a renewable and regenerative economy is that the companies that are building the frac gas pipelines and more fossil fuels are, are incentivized to put their shareholders first rather than what New Yorkers want to see for their energy future. 
It is only by getting contracts to build new infrastructure that they are able to reward their shareholders. And I say they when it is really we who are paying out those rewards. It is in their financial interest to not give customers information about alternatives to gas, but it is essential to our best interest. That's why we are 100% supporting Intro 1946. Thank you for this work. Just yesterday, I ran into my neighbor, Luis, on the sidewalk in front of his house. He was waiting for the fire department to come check his gas boiler, as they do every other year. He told me he needs to convert his oil boiler to gas. I started to talk to him about the CLCPA, the climate goals, and the promises, and how, if he buys a boiler, he might end up paying for something that was no longer viable in 10 years, meaning he would be investing in a stranded asset. He said to me, that's $20,000. Then we started to talk about heat pumps. My conversation with Luis yesterday is exactly the kind of conversation that this law would provide. Homeowners in Brooklyn wouldn't have to rely on running into a neighbor accidentally to plan for the future for both their own households and the planet. The time is now to act with great urgency. These conversations should never have to happen going forward in new construction. Given the impending emissions regulations mandated in Local Law 97, along with the mandates specified by the CLCPA, we need to act now to legislate all new development in New York City be constructed using only renewable energy. I hope that this is the next legislation that the No North Brooklyn Pipeline Coalition will be here to support. Lastly, we support both Intro 142 and Intro 143. North Brooklyn has one of the highest asthma rates in the city and currently is being subjected to massive amounts of dust from a plethora of huge construction projects. And we appreciate any amount of oversight and specificity imposed upon these construction sites to limit their impact, respecting our health and safety. The need for Intro 143 is unquestioned given the density of our population and the risks we face from a fire breaking out in any one of the many potentially contaminated sites in Greenpoint. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Thank you very much. Thank you. It seems that we have one more witness, Seth Silverman. Is Seth Silverman available to testify? Uh, yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Starting Fantastic. time. So I'm testifying in support of 1946 as well. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, interested in the convergence of, of two issues. One, the start, the implementation last year of Local Law 152, which went into effect and requires city buildings um, to be inspected for gas leaks once every five years. And the other, um, the advancement of the Climate Mobilization Act with a slew of key priorities for um, moving uh, New York City forward in climate responsibility. Um, the, the city council needs to make sure that the, these converging events, the city's critically important responses to the climate emergency and the gas line inspection and repair requirements don't operate in conflict or in conflicting purposes with one another and do not result in costly missed opportunities. As a climate and environment professional myself, I came to be aware of this issue when the gas line to my own building was switched off in the middle of July of last year. I still don't have uh, cooking gas in my apartment as the building works through uh, restoring the gas service. Um, apparently dozens of other buildings in New York City have already had their gas shut off and are facing this issue. My building has 630 units and the building management is under a huge amount of pressure to restore energy services. This is a major capital investment um, and it will cost buildings across the city millions of dollars and lock them into restoring greenhouse gas emitting energy for cooking and heating, just as the capacity to deliver natural gas into New York City becomes constrained by appropriate limitations on new pipelines. Um, rather than defaulting to regasifying and locking in a climate polluting future at substantial capital expense, following a local Law 152 event, the city through the Office of Energy and Emissions Performance should provide technical assistance, policy supports and incentives, and pace financing to help buildings and their owners, managements, and boards transition to cleaner and safer alternatives, and technical assistance must be provided to buildings to ensure that whatever they do following a local law 152 event, they do it safely and with a better understanding of the hazards of natural gas than most buildings will have. As such, I wholeheartedly support 1946 while encouraging the council to develop it further and include all of these elements um, that I've just mentioned. At the moment, it seems a useful placeholder, but too vague and too limited in scope um, for the work at hand. Um, support resources to buildings should follow immediately behind a shutoff event 
a city-backed climate improvement SWAT team that takes the challenge and complexity of exploring climate-friendly alternatives off of overburdened and relatively unsophisticated, at least in these matters, building owners, management, and boards um, should be provided. Information must be provided directly to tenants as well, um, or shareholders alongside building owners, managers, and boards. The legislation should require the city through OE to mail every resident in a building um, affected by a gas shutoff, a comprehensive description of options that the building manager can consider within seven days of a gas service being shut off. Um, representatives OE should also be made available to the building residents, owners, and management. Um, I also think the city council should mandate that the Office of Energy and Emissions Performance within the DOB perform a feasibility study of electrification of different classes of buildings to help describe pathways to safer, cleaner energy for buildings when, whenever gas leak issues are uncovered under local law 152. This mandate would mirror local law 2019-099 uh, um, requirement for a feasibility study for replacing natural gas generators in the city with renewable energy and battery storage once every four years. Finally, uh, Local Law 97 currently penalizes uh, a shift from natural gas for cooking and heating to electricity by charging electricity a higher uh, tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per kilowatt hour. And um, the city council should consider revising uh, that uh, multiplier as well, particularly given that electricity can be made clean and natural gas cannot. So thanks for addressing this important and emergent issue. I reiterate my support for 1946 and encourage you to build on it uh, to advance a more comprehensive and effective response to these converging concerns. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you. Seth Silverman. Uh, Councilman Constantinides, if, is there anyone else who would like to offer testimony at this time? Uh, and if, if no one else is, then Const Constantinides, um, this is on you, closing remarks. Okay, well, I wanna thank everyone who testified today. Um, I definitely appreciate all of you taking the time uh, to participate in this hearing, to have your voices heard and be part of uh, so many of these important issues. I wanna thank our staff. Uh, I'll begin with our council and our moderator today, uh, the amazing Samara Swanston. Thank you, Samara. Uh, You're welcome. Great work. I always appreciate you, Samara. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nadia Johnson and Ricky Chawla, our policy analysts, thank you both for all that you do and all of your great work. Um, you've been silent today, but you're always loud and working hard for us, so thank you. Um, Jonathan Seltzer, our financial analyst, thank you, Jonathan, uh, for your work. Uh, Tirza Nasser and Megan Chen as well uh, for helping us get the hearing ready yesterday and today and making sure we're running smoothly. Of course, I wanna thank our Sergeant at Arms uh, for all of your work. I know this is very difficult uh, via uh, sort of online and you guys have done it well today, so thank you. Um, and lastly, to our speaker and to all council staff, uh, thank you for your leadership. Um, with that, uh, oh, one person I have to really thank, thank you Council Member Steve Levin uh, for chairing this hearing and for being a great environmental leader in your own right. I appreciate your filling in for me earlier today. And it's, it's really good to be part of this hearing. Uh, I mean, everyone knows, for those of you who don't know, my, my sort of journey as a long hauler post COVID, um, this is definitely, uh, it's good to be back. It's good to be as part of this hearing. Uh, and I look forward to continuing the work of this committee. Uh, came on to an opportunity uh, to continue our journey to decarbonize New York City and to continue to fight for renewable energy and for a cleaner, greener city. And never was that was more important than now. So I definitely look forward to continuing this work and working with everyone who's testified today and with the staff here and to the administration as well. Uh, thank you for your uh, partnership. And uh, with that, uh, I don't have a gavel. But with that, I will gavel this committee hearing of the of the Committee on Environmental Protection closed.